بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين ورحمة الله للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد All the praise and all the glory is due to Allah and I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his last prophet and messenger May the blessings and peace of Allah be upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his companions, his uh, followers, and his family up to the day of judgment. Uh, we continue, inshallah, explaining uh, our series of ahadith or prophetic traditions on the legal rulings included in the very well-known book, Umdat Al-Ahkam. And Umdat Al-Ahkam, or the essence of legal rulings, is a very important book that includes the authentic ahadith reported by both Al-Bukhari and Muslim in their authentic books. And it tackles most of the issues related to Islamic law or related to Islamic jurisprudence. In today's lecture, we are explaining the hadith uh, number 23, and this is the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him. We will read the hadith in Arabic, and then elaborate some of the legal rulings included. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this session, to shower his mercy upon all of us and to provide us with the beneficial knowledge which is translated into action. An Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu qal Kuntu rajulan mazza'an fastahyaytu an as'ala rasulallahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam limakan ibnatihi minni fa'amartu al-miqdad ibn al-aswad فقال فسأله فقال يغسل ذكره ويتوضأ. On the authority of Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, who said, I used to excrete al-mazy. And al-mazy is translated as a prostatic fluid. Frequently, being the son-in-law of the Messenger of Allah, blessings and peace of Allah be upon him, I felt shy to ask the Messenger. So I delegated Al-Miqdad ibn al-Aswad to ask on my behalf. So he asked the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said to him, let him wash his private parts and perform ablution. There is another version which is included in Al-Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ commanded Ali ibn Abi Talib to perform ablution and wash his penis. According to the variant narration related by Muslim, he said to him, perform ablution and sprinkle water on your private parts. This hadith is included in the chapter trail and meant for the invalidators of ablution. The invalidators of ablution include a lot of things and the compiler of the book elaborated one of them which is the excretion of the prostatic fluid. This is the main topic of the hadith and it also discusses the issue whether this fluid is pure or impure what is required because there is a confusion among the people whether it requires a ritual bath or it is sufficient just to have ablution. And this is one of the issues that Ali ibn Abi Talib wanted to ask the Prophet Wasallam about. First of all, who is Ali? Who is Ali ibn Abi Talib? Ali ibn Abi Talib is the brother-in-law of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he is one of the top ten the top 10 who were promised to receive the glide tidings of being in the Jannah, the Garden of Paradise. 
the Prophet ﷺ gave them the news of being among the elite who are prepared to enter the Jannah while they are still alive. And he is one of the four top rightly guided caliphs after the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. The Messenger had a hadith in this context and he said that the rightly guided caliphate will last for 30 years after the death of the Messenger ﷺ. That's why Ali ibn Abi Talib died in the 40th year after the Hijrah. And this is called the Amul Jama'ah or the year where all the Muslims gather together under one ruler. And this is the year where Ali, when Ali ibn Abi Talib died. Ali ibn Abi Talib occupies a great status in the history of Islam. Because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned an authentic hadith regarding him. And he said, you are to me or you belong to me as Moses or Harun belong to Moses salam. But you are not a prophet because there is no prophet after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in, mutual, in the mutual support, mutual help, and the great care that Ali ibn Abi Talib gave to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the prophet gave to him, he is compared to Harun, the brother of Moses alayhi salam. Also Ali ibn Abi Talib is one of the greatest people who were very well known for their deeply rooted knowledge about Islam and giving decisive and clear rulings deduced from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Also the Prophet ﷺ mentioned another hadith regarding him and he said yani, Ali ibn Abi Talib is not only compared to Harun but he is also compared to Jesus son of Mary peace be upon him. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, you are like Jesus. Two parties went to the extreme regarding Jesus ﷺ. The Jews said that he is a result of fornication. And the Christians ex exaggerated in worshipping Jesus and they regarded him the son of God. So the same happened with Ali ibn Abi Talib. The Shia exaggerated in the love and respect of Ali ibn Abi Talib to the extent that some of them worshipped Ali. And some of them raised him to a higher status. And they believed that Jibreel السلام, made a mistake and he delivered the message to Muhammad وسلم, instead of Ali. And they gave preference to Ali ibn Abi Talib to the other three rightly guided caliphs namely Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman. But the greats are given according to the Quran and according to the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Ali is graded as the fourth caliph and the fourth in position after Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Uthman ibn Affan, according to the Sunnah and according to the grading the Prophet ﷺ. And all of them are blessed and all of them are companions of the Prophet ﷺ, and all of them are promised the Jannah while they were still alive. It is sufficient also to say that Ali ibn Abi Talib is one of the people that you remember when the Prophet ﷺ was in the battle of Khaybar. And he waited for long nights and days to conquer the fortresses of the people or the Jews. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Tonight or tomorrow I'm going to give the flag of war to somebody who is beloved by Allah and he loves Allah. And definitely Allah is going to grant him victory. Who was this person? Even Ali, Umar ibn al-Khattab, I used to crave. And I never ever wanted anything in this life but I wish to be that man described by the Prophet ﷺ. Who was this man? It was Ali ibn Abi Talib. May Allah be pleased with him. And Ali ibn Abi Talib is one of the young generation who received the message and delivered to the people and was one of the people prepared under the eyes of the Messenger ﷺ. And he represented one third of Islam one day when only three people accepted Islam. 
It is Khadija, the, the wife of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ali, and also who is the third, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Khadija bint Khuwailid, and, and Abu Bakr Siddiq. So Ali is the youngest one of them. Khadija was of the, uh, of the women, the first woman to accept Islam, and Abu Bakr was of the elderly. That's why one of the Bedouins was passing by the Prophet وسلم, one day and he asked, uh, he asked Abu Sufyan or Al Abbas, and he told, Who is that person who is circumambulating around the Kaaba? Uh, Al Abbas said, It is my nephew Muhammad. He claims to be a prophet, and this is his cousin Ali. He believed in him, and this is his wife Khadija. And this is Abu Bakr. So the man turned his face away from the Prophet ﷺ. You cannot imagine that this turning away cost that man 20 years and he did not accept Islam. The man came afterwards, after 20 years, and he said, Wow to me, had I accepted Islam on the first day, I would have been one fourth of Islam because Islam was only three people or four people and he represented the fifth. He would be actually the fifth after the, after the Prophet ﷺ. This gives us a lesson of how a person turns his... There are a lot of situations we are given golden opportunities to draw ourselves closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you lose this opportunity, after a while, Allah is going to give you another opportunity. Whenever you do not respond to those golden opportunities given to you and those reminders or messages given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe that a time will come and you will be delayed. This is the explanation of the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, who said that there are a lot of people who keep themselves delayed from attending the first throws in prayer until Allah delays them in the hellfire. So people would actually delay, keep themselves delayed all the time until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will postpone the opportunity of receiving His mercy in the day of a judgment. Ali ibn Abi Talib was one of those people who snatched this golden opportunity to become one of the pioneering and the first people to accept the religion of Allah. And those people had a very great rank in Islam. Uh, on the top of them, we have the top 10 giving glad tidings of the Jannah. And among the, those elite are the selected ones to be the four rightly guided caliphs. And also the early people who joined the Prophet وسلم, in the battle of Badr. The Prophet وسلم, said regarding those people, do whatever you like to do. Allah has already known all what you have done and Allah has already decreed to forgive all your sins, to have all of your sins being forgiven. This is a very important statement about Ali. Do you want to learn how to recite the Qur'an? Do you want to read Islamic books in Arabic? You may enroll in a small group. A private lesson. Or at your own pace to fit your schedule. Courses for sisters with female instructors. We're bringing you the latest software technology, professional instructors, and a state-of-the-art classroom to the comfort of your home. Enroll now in Huda Academy. Huda Academy, your gateway to authentic Islamic knowledge.
There is another aspect of Ali's personality which is reflected in this hadith. Although we are explaining a hadith on legal rulings, but in fact we have some manners and behavior which is reflected through the way the Sahaba accompanied the Prophet ﷺ. Here, Ali ibn Abi Talib was shy to ask the Prophet ﷺ about this question. And he explained the reason of his shyness or his modesty. And he said because he is married, he was married to Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. Ali ibn Abi Talib used to have or to excrete fluids. And he was, this, these fluids results in fact uh, from uh, having foreplay with the wife and this stuff. So he was afraid to approach the Prophet ﷺ and to talk to him about some secrets, some private secrets about his wife. <coughs> the wife of Ali is the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. That's why he delegated Al-Aswad, Al-Maqdad ibn Al-Aswad, to ask on his behalf. I need to emphasize on the fact that in our community, in our Muslim community, we lose chastity. Because of mingling with, sometimes with a lot of cultures, the nation of the Muslim nation started to have a thin, uh, a thin gap or a thin line of what you can call chastity and modesty. And this is felt with the relationship that we have. In Islam, there is a sense of modesty and it is a part of Iman. The Prophet said, Al Iman bid'un wa sab'oon shu'bah. أعلاها قول لا إله إلا الله وأدناها إماطة الأذى عن الطريق إيمان consists of 70 something branches the highest of them is the testimony of faith لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his last prophet and messenger and the lowest in degree is to remove a harmful thing from the road of people and chastity is one of the branches of Iman. Why the Prophet ﷺ put modesty or chastity here in this context? And I need also to emphasize that the word the haya doesn't have a translation in English language. If you translate it as, as shyness, it has a negative implication. But it is a comprehensive mood of behavior and manner which includes all the good manners, all the code of good manners that protects the believer from doing everything that may hurt his position towards Allah or his position in front of the people. Who is shy to make something in front of people? It is more worthy to be shy in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because everything is going to be exposed. This is the reason that the ummah, the Muslim ummah, used to have this criterion of iman. That's why the Prophet ﷺ made, put it in the middle. Chastity and modesty and having shyness to approach what is abominable, what is hated, what is disliked, what's not loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is a sign of a living iman. Iman which is full with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the reason that we have it uh, represented in all the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet but there are two types of haya, one which is negative and one which is positive. The negative aspect of haya is when you are afraid of approaching something disliked by Allah. But there is another type of haya, like for example, when the Prophet ﷺ passed by two people, and this, there was one of the Ansar, and he was a very peaceful person. And he didn't have the courage to face the people sometimes with some critical issues. And this man, uh, so in our, in our society, in our community, we feel that he is uh, a person who cannot have the courage to talk about himself. He has that kind of modesty that prevents him from talking brave in, in a courageous way. So there is another person approaching him and he started to ask him not to be modest. So the Prophet ﷺ told him, no, don't ask him not to be modest. 
because modesty brings all what is good. There is so modesty in this situation to keep yourself away from hated and disliked things is recommended. But there is another type of haya that is actually negative. Like for example, when you see something wrong and you are not proactive enough to correct it. When you do not have the courage to enjoy good and forbid evil, this is negative haya. There is another haya when you have a question and you don't dare to ask the scholars about it. That's why the female companion of Musulama, uh, Umm Sulaim, when she came to the Prophet وسلم, and she asked him about a very private affair, what, the, what she said, she introduced her speech by saying, O oh, Messenger of Allah, Inna Allah la yastahyi min al haqq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes the people who speak about the truth, who ask about things to learn. So haya in terms of knowledge is not recommended because it keeps you away from learning your, your religion. And the scholar said that there are two diseases that keep a person away from receiving proper knowledge. The first disease is arrogance. When you feel that you are arrogant to ask, that's why the Arab scholars said or the people said, that the water, when it falls, the rain falls, it stops in the lowest part of the valley. This is the same when you are a student of knowledge, you need to approach your teacher, you need to, to approach your knowledge, knowledge in that sense, sense of need, sense of dire need to, to, to learn and to be thirst, to quench that thirsty, because that thirst is very important to let you be admitted to the Jannah. So haya in this, in asking, is not recommended. So anyhow, Ali ibn Abi Talib asked Al-Maqdad ibn Al-Aswan to ask on his behalf. So the Prophet وسلم, and this is another issue also, is it permissible for a person to ask on behalf of the other? Yes, it is permissible. So the question raised now, what is the response of the scholar? The, the scholar said that, when a person asks on behalf of the other, the scholar has two reactions. Whether he answers the question or not, if he feels that the person is arrogant and he doesn't like to receive knowledge properly, he may dismiss and he may not answer the question. And we have a proof for this in Sahih al-Bukhari and the authentic hadith of Uwaymir al-Ajlani and his cousin Asim al-Ajlani. Uwaymir wanted to ask the Prophet وسلم, about an issue which is very int intricate. He said to his, he had an incident and he wanted actually to ask the Prophet ﷺ. He said, imagine a person having a man with his wife. If he kills her, you are going actually to apply the law of equity of Qusas and you will kill him. And if he keeps himself silent, so he will keep in himself a revolution or what you can call something that he cannot bear. So he asked Asim to go and ask on his behalf. So when the Prophet ﷺ received this question, he hated the question. He didn't give him an answer. So he returned it back to his cousin. And when Umaymir received no response, he went back to the Prophet ﷺ. And the second time, the Prophet ﷺ gave him an answer. Meaning that the Prophet ﷺ in the first occasion did not give a response for two reasons. Number one, he felt that the person may be arrogant. Or number two, because it was a hypothetical question. In Islam, we are not required to give hypothetical answers or hypothetical questions of answers. We are required to focus on the text in our hand, not to excessively question and question on things which did not happen. Occupy yourself with the Quran and the Sunnah and don't step forward to things which did not happen in your life because when they occur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you a solution. This is the reason that the Prophet ﷺ answered Al-Miqdad in this occasion. What is important about this hadith also of the legal rulings, that it is one of the basic rules in Islam that excreting a fluid, a prosthetic fluid, invalidates ablution. Because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that it requires ablution, wudu, in this occasion. Number two, it is impure because the messenger also mentioned to Ali that he must wash the part which is diluted or polluted therewith. 
And the scholars differed about it because we have some excre ex excrements. Number one, if there is urine is impure and it invalidates ablution. Many is pure or sperm is pure, but it invalidates the major state of ritual impurity or purity. So it requires ritual baths. Number three, the madhi and madhi, it is like the urine and it actually is impure and in fact it invalidates ablution. There is something which is related to science here because the Prophet ﷺ asked Ali not to wash his penis or his private parts only, but he asked him to wash even his tests. And some scholars said that it is because of the, it is a disease which falls in the body and the effective way is to wash the whole private parts with water. That's why the majority of scholars said that it is required to wash it with water, not with any other alternative. And this is emphasized through the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is a meaning which is compatible to modern science as the modern scientists mentioned. Also from this hadith, there is a very important ruling uh, that there is a difference between fatwa and the judgment of the in the court the fatwa we need to understand that the fatwa is a statement or an answer to a question which is not binding you are not required to follow not to require to, to follow the fatwa but in fatwa your aim and your goal is only to keep yourself away from your own desire and to submit all your intention and all your orientation to the creator of your desire, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you turn yourself from the whisperings to the decrees of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the courts, it's something which is binding. That's why the Prophet ﷺ gave him a fatwa in this occasion. And the fatwa uh, is not something which is related to the application. It is just a statement. And according to the way you raise the question, you receive the response. And this is a very delicate way in raising our question in a way to be very fair to ourselves and therefore we receive a correct response from the scholar that we ask. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of this session to shower his mercy upon all of us and to provide us with beneficial knowledge. إنه ولي ذلك والقادر عليه وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. Oh, 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 oh.